Hello, my name is Jonathan Clark, also known as DJ Bolivia, and welcome to another video in my tutorial series about basic audio recording. Now, so far I've done uh, probably about half a dozen videos where I dealt with actual hands-on projects, uh, practical projects, where I'd record either piano, guitar, vocals, whatever, and uh, try to create a song. So basically we'd use either video camera microphones or we'd use professional microphones or we'd use a portable audio recorder, get the signal into the computer, do some editing with a desktop audio workstation, uh, audio editing software, and then maybe do some effects processing, equalization, and come out with a final product, um, like the compiled bounced song that could be shared with the public. Now I also did another video which instead of hands-on was theory-based and in that one I covered sample rates, sample frequency, and uh, a little bit of an exploration into the binary system. Okay, so if you haven't uh, watched any of those and you're interested, there's the link. Uh, you don't necessarily have to watch any of those before you watch this one. Today I'm going to try, uh, I'm going to attempt a very difficult topic. Uh, I'm going to try and explain how decibels work. And I'm also going to talk about signal to noise ratios. Now, this is a, another theoretical video, obviously. And this is a tough, uh, this is a tough subject to explain. I mean, I, uh, there's a lot of math, advanced math behind understanding how decibels work. And I don't want to subject you to all of that. Um, I mean, I, I'm very comfortable with math. Um, you know, when I was in high school, I, I won a lot of math awards and stuff like that. And even I find the math behind all this to be very confusing. So that's not what I really want to get into. I'll have to get into some numbers, obviously, to explain some of this. But I'm going to try and explain concepts rather than the exact perfect science and mathematics behind it all. Okay, so uh, it'll be a little bit uh, challenging at times, but it's going to be very useful information if you actually want to get good at doing home studio recording or work in a professional studio, because this information is going to help you understand and monitor your signal levels throughout the whole recording process, which is a key, key um, part of the recording process if you want to come out with a good product in the end. Okay, so some very, very important stuff to learn here. I'll try and make this as easy as possible. Okay, so bear with me. So what are decibels? Well, the decibel is, it's, it's a system of, it's a unit of measurement. Um, so the need for decibels came about because it actually started with the telephone companies, I don't know, 100 some years ago. Uh, and they needed a way to measure gains and losses in power across their telephone grids. So they came up with this, uh, this system of measuring stuff. And I don't know if you realize, but uh, <clears throat> the inventor of the telephone was a guy named Alexander Graham Bell. And he lived in uh, Nova Scotia in Canada, which is where I grew up. And anyway, he invented this telephone and... And, and basically the telephone companies, when they came up with this system of measuring power losses and stuff like this, they decided to name the unit of uh, measurement after Alexander Graham Bell. So they came up with the bell, which is kind of interesting because his name had two L's and Bell only has one. Anyway, Bell as a unit um, was too big and it was, it was awkward for measuring small amounts. So they decided to come up with a smaller measurement, the decibel. And a decibel equals one-tenth of a bell. Okay, so it's a little bit more manageable unit to work with. Um, and what does it measure? Well, it measure changes in power. So what's power? Power is a change in energy over time. And that can either be a gain in power, so there's power coming into a system, or it can be the loss of power or dissipation of power. Okay, so basically the problem is with power is it is measured best on what's called a logarithmic 
or an exponential scale. It's not a linear, uh, linear use sort of situation. So that makes it a little bit confusing to measure. Now, let me give you an, an analogy. Let's say that we were traveling in a spaceship and we were traveling between the stars and we were going at very, very fast speeds, like the speed of light, um, or multiples of the speed of light. Let's assume you could do that. Okay, and so you've got this rate. Light is usually, the speed of light is usually abbreviated C in the science community. So let's say we're going five or six times the speed of light, so we're going at five or six C, and we get close to our destination, and we have to slow right down because we're coming up to a planet. And then the, uh, the navigator says, uh, we need you to be going like 300 miles an hour. Okay? There is such a huge difference between 300 miles an hour and five or six times the speed of light that trying to measure those two things, those two speeds, with the same system of measurement just doesn't make any sense. It's, it's inconceivable. It'd be like if you were trying to design a scale that was able to measure the weight of a feather and also measure the weight of the Empire State Building. Okay, it's just totally different scales. So what do you do? You either come up with two totally separate systems of measuring stuff, one for big quantities and one for very, very small quantities, or you go with a logarithmic scale, exponential stuff, okay? And that's what happens with sound. Now, the amount of power in different sounds is, uh, the changes in power levels are staggering. So, if you look at the difference between the quietest possible sound that a human can hear and the loudest possible sound that a human can hear before hearing damage, the difference in levels is one trillion times, okay? That's a million million times the amount of difference in power between the lowest level and the highest level. Now, within, uh, within the hearing range, there's a couple terms that are used, threshold terms, okay? So one of them at the low end is called the threshold, threshold of hearing or the threshold of audibility. And so that is the quietest possible sound that an average human can hear. Okay, it's kind of a theoretical thing. You can't really pick one person. Um, and you can't really measure the exact amount of energy, it's a guess. But threshold of audibility is at the low end. And then near the upper end, there's one called the threshold of feeling. And I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where a sound is so loud that you can start to feel it. Um, I mean, sometimes it happens with, with bass notes in a club um, because the bass has to be... Low frequencies have to be a lot louder than mid-range frequencies in order to be perceived as loud. So with bass bins, you get some really heavy, heavy volumes with the bass, and it kind of makes you, your whole body shake. And actually, any frequency, it gets to the point where you can actually feel it. So if something's really loud, you can plug your ears, but you can still even, well, obviously the sound kind of bleeds in through your fingers into your ears, but you can also feel it, your whole body. That is the threshold of feeling. And not very high above that, there's another threshold called the threshold of pain. And that's where you start to get uh, very, very rapid hearing damage. And for DJs uh, and for audio engineers, protecting your hearing is one of the most important things you should do. And I see a lot of uh, young DJs and producers that don't really seem to care about this. Um, it's a disaster. I mean, you don't want to lose your hearing. You can't get it back. So if you're a DJ, I always recommend that you get some good noise-reducing uh, hearing attenuation plugs. Uh, very, very smart idea. Very wise investment. Anyway, um, 
So threshold of pain above that level, uh, hearing damage very, very quickly. Okay, but the difference in the amount of power in the system between that threshold of audibility and the threshold of pain is about a trillion times as much power. Now, what's interesting is that they've come up with this system of measurement decibels, which is used to measure how much, uh, how much uh, power. Okay, so I've created this chart, and this is where two minutes of annoying math comes in. What I've basically done was I've tried to come up with a list of the loudness levels, and this is something I have totally just made up on my own. There's no such thing as the chart of loudness levels in official scientific uh, terminology. Uh, but what is appropriate is the power levels. Okay, so we go from 1, 10, 100, right up to 1 trillion. And then I've also got these measurements of decibels. 0 decibels, 10 decibels, 20, 30, 40, right up to 120. And so I said a few minutes ago, 0 is kind of really quiet, uh, incredibly quiet. 20 is um, what you'd hear in an isolated studio room. Uh, down to, say, 120 is like louder than a jackhammer, like a quiet jet engine, which is very, very loud, loud rock concert, something like that. Okay, so our system of measurements of decibels, basically what it is, logarithmic, exponential, and so it's powers of 10. And if you watch that video that I did on uh, sample rates and sample frequency, you understand powers. So powers, um, anything to the zero power equals one, always. Anything to the first power equals itself. And then anything to higher number powers is just, it keeps multiplying itself. So 10 times 10, 10 times 10 times 10, 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. Okay, so you get all these different numbers. Okay, so 10 to the 10th equals 10 uh, billion. Um, I'm talking North America systems too. I meant to look this up. I think the British use a different uh, interpretation of what a billion is. But for us, it's ones, thousands, millions, billions, trillions, okay? Um, so anyway, as you go up in power, you know, going from zero decibels, skip down three rows, to 30 decibels, you're going from one unit of power, whatever that unit is, to a thousand units of power. So you've got a thousand times as much power, okay? And in doing so, you've gone up from zero to 30, so you've gone 30 decibels, okay? So 30 decibel increase equals 1,000 times as much. Now let's try it somewhere else on the chart. We'll start at 100,000. If you go three levels from 100,000, 1, 2, 3, to 100 million, it's interesting. It's a thousand times as much still by going three levels. And from 50 up to 80, again, is an increase of 30 decibels. Okay? So from this chart, you can see that there's a direct relationship. Maybe I shouldn't use direct, because direct you'll assume to mean linear, um, and it's exponential. There's a correlation, is a better way of putting it, okay? So basically, anytime you go 10 times the amount of power, you add 10 decibels, okay? That's a bit of a dangerous interpretation, because if you, if you heard that by itself, 10 times the power is 10 extra decibels, then you might think 20 times the power is 20 decibels. That's not true, because 20 decibel increase is 100 times. Now, loudness is another thing. Loudness, when you jump 10 times as much power, you double your apparent loudness, approximately. Um, it, it's hard to tell, because you can't... It's hard for someone to measure loudness because it's very subjective. It depends on the person. 
And for years and years, they said doubling loudness, they figured, was around, uh, or sorry, 10 time increase in, in power of the sound was around a doubling. Um, after a while, they started to revise that, and they think that it's probably more like about eight times as much power is a doubling of the, uh, of the apparent loudness. Anyway, it doesn't matter, but it's the same sort of relationship. And what's interesting, well, I'll come to that in a second. Okay, so we go with the same thing, go, skipping down three levels. Power goes a thousand times as much. Loudness goes eight times as much. Go from a million to a billion. A thousand times as much power. From 64 to 512. That's eight times as much. Okay? Anytime you go ten times as much power, just skipping one level, you basically double your apparent volume. Okay? So that's really quite useful to know. Double the volume, ten times the power. Now, what's interesting is the correlation here is the fact that your powers of ten, if you look at your loudness, you can go powers of two. Two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two, two to the three, two to the four, two to the five, six, two to the seven, two to the eight, two to the nine, two to the ten, two to the eleven, to the 12. Now, is this a perfectly scientific accurate chart? Um, no, not entirely. This side of it is. Um, we know for sure, because this is the whole way that the measurements of decibels were designed, that doing this 10 times power equals 10 extra decibels. That's all scientific written down in formulas. The loudness, like I said, it's subjective, it depends on people's interpretation. So it might be, if they think it's actually a slightly smaller value than ten, 10 times the power, if it's only 8 times the power, then it may be that the system, instead of powers of 2, is powers of 1.81, or powers of 2.13 or something like that. doesn't matter. The general approach is that most of the time, to go 10 times as much power, 10 extra decibels, double the volume. Okay, so why is this important? Well, before I tell you why that's important, uh, I want to give you a little trivia. This amount of difference, the fact that the human ear can perceive differences that are a trillion times you know, the multiple from the quietest possible sound to the loudest before you, uh, before pain, is approximately a trillion times. That's a phenomenal range. Um, a lot of times we compare, or I compare, light and sound because they have similar properties in a lot of ways. They're both something that we sense, okay? They're both measured in frequency. But are they exactly the same? Um, you know, it's, it's easy to think of light being very short uh, waveforms, very quick, high, high frequency. Um, it's very simple to think of light as being a high frequency um, phenomena that's very similar to sound at the very low frequencies. But it's not a direct comparison. There are two different things. Light, the frequency of light, well, light is radio waves, okay? Electromagnetic frequencies. Sound, on the other hand, is not a radio wave. It's a... Sound is produced by the oscillation of molecules, okay? So if you can imagine... Do you know what those little... Uh, have, you, have you seen those little ticker things on people's people's desks. It's like a little swing set and it's got a bunch of balls hanging from it and you can you can lift one ball back, let go, and it goes down and hits these ones and the ball at the end shoots up in the air 
but these ones all stay in the same place. And then after it hangs up there for a second, it falls back down, boom, hits these, and then this one, which by now is resting there, it bounces, and it just kind of keeps going back and forth. Well, sound is sort of very similar in the way, because what happens is you've got all the molecules in the air, and then a sound happens at one point, say it's over here, loudspeaker, boom, and the energy in the sound starts this molecule vibrating and then it bumps into the next one and starts that one vibrating and then it starts that one vibrating and it just passes through in a chain reaction until it gets to the human which you know here it looks like a human's a couple feet away but it's really billions and billions of molecules in between that have started shaking that have been launched into motion because of the sound okay so as i'm talking right now there's literally countless numbers, billions of molecules in the air around me shaking because of my voice. So <clears throat> all this, uh, all this shaking, light being a radio frequency and sound being propagated through a medium because of vibrating molecules, different phenomena. Now with sound, there's variable speeds. With light, there's a single speed, okay? And that's because radio waves go at basically a certain speed. Actually, I think there's a tiny, tiny, infinitesimally small difference in speed between some types of radio waves, but I'm not positive about that. Um, but with sound waves, there's a huge difference depending on what they're going through. Okay, because they rely on bumping into other molecules to propagate, something that is more densely packed is going to transmit sound faster because it's easier for a molecule to bump into its neighbor. So in, in air, if you had air at sea level, then the speed of sound is around, I think, 1130 feet per second, which is 300 some meters per second. If you go underwater, water is a lot more dense than air, and it propagates a lot faster. I think it goes about five times as fast in water as it does in air at sea level. And so, if you're in the ocean, I mean, they talk about they talk about whales in the Atlantic Ocean being able to hear the mating calls of whales around in the Pacific. Sound travels through water that well. Is that true? I don't know. Um, but it certainly goes a lot faster. I don't know if the sound is better, per se, but certainly faster. Uh, now, the other thing that's a difference between sound and light is the way that our senses perceive them. A trillion times the difference from the quietest sound to the loudest sound that we can perceive. For light, the range is far less. From the darkest object that we can see, or the, sorry, the dimmest light that we can see to the brightest light before we have, uh, before the threshold of pain is, is, uh, is achieved, um, that difference in power level is only about a thousand times, okay? So our eyes are a lot less sensitive to a wide range of uh, input. Now the only, there are other similarities though, I mean with the eye, the eye has a physical mechanism for trying to um, reduce the amount of signal coming in when it gets brighter because your pupil constricts. And with the ear, it's the same sort of thing. The, the way that your hearing works, your ear has little uh, tiny hairs, cilia, I think, <coughs> inside it. And the vibrating sound molecules make your, uh, the hairs in the inner ear move and then the brain interprets that movement as sound, which is, it's incredible how it all works. But the ear has a mechanism where if the sound is coming in uh, at a louder level, it'll actually constrict to try and dampen the sound because the hairs on the inside of your ear don't naturally have the ability to understand such a magnitude of difference. So it's kind of, uh, 
the brain interprets based on what the what the hairs do compared with the uh, with the ear physically reacting to louder volumes to uh, to mitigate the amount of sound coming in. Okay, so I was going to talk about why it's important all these different powers ratios and uh, loudness ratios. So let me clear the board and we'll do that. So the decibel is a unit of measurement. Now, the interesting thing which really confuses people is that, well, there's a couple things. First of all, there's all kinds of different decibels in the world of audio. Uh, and secondly, it's not really an absolute value per se. What decibels measure is a ratio and it's a ratio away from some predetermined reference point. Okay, so let me cover some of the different types of decibel measurements out there and hopefully this will make more sense. Because when you think decibels, you are thinking of audio volume right off the bat, okay? But decibels don't have to measure audible audio volume that a human ear would hear. It can also measure voltage levels in an audio system. It can measure power levels in an audio system. Okay, so looking at some of these uh, different options we have here, if you see dB PWL, that means power level. And what they do for a reference, uh, reference number, reference measurement, is they go in picowatts. And a picowatt is 10 to the negative 12 watts. So how much is that? That's one trillionth of a watt. Um, very, very small number. Now, if you're familiar with uh, light bulbs, for example, you know that the old incandescent uh, light bulbs that used to be very common would have numbers like 60 watts or 100 watts. And one of the very dimmest bulbs that you could get, um, like a night lamp sort of thing, you might be able to get a half watt light bulb. Very, very dim. It's like the faintest signal possible. Well, something that's really neat about sound is that the amount of sound required to make an impression on your sense of hearing is infinitesimally smaller than the amount of light required to make an impression on your senses. Okay, so in light, you know, you can look at a 100 watt light bulb and it's pretty bright on the eyes. Uh, you can look at a half watt light bulb and that's about the faintest thing you can see. By contrast, in the world of actual audible sound, if you have a sound that has a watt of power, one watt of power, that is about the loudest possible sound you can imagine. Okay, so if you're talking about human speech at a normal level, like I'm speaking right now, you are looking at a level of about one micro watt, which is one millionth of a watt. Basically, if you could, <clears throat> if you could take a normal light bulb and say it's a 60 watt light bulb, and you could convert that, so instead of outputting that amount of wattage in the form of light, if you could instead turn that into sound, it would be so loud that it would probably kill you. Which sounds absolutely ridiculous, but it's possible for loud sounds to kill people. And I think it's usually around 100, <clears throat> 180 decibels is the level at which it kills a person. Anyway, yeah, um, the amount of power in uh, light bulbs, if it was translated to sound, it would be just phenomenally large. Okay, so picowatt, your reference amount, reference measurement, so that would mean one unit of something. So the unit is the picowatt, one PW that translates to zero decibels of whatever system. Because remember, 10 to the zero equals one. 
okay? And this would actually be written out as zero decibels PWL, so that we know exactly what's being measured. So within the PWL system, if you had human conversation at uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, at 10 to the minus 6 watts, or 1 micro watt, okay, that would translate, we're 6 powers above the reference of 10 to the minus 12, we're a million times louder, that's 10 power, so, sorry, 6 powers of 10, so basically that means our human conversation would be about 60 decibels, okay? 6 powers of 10 from the base referent amount, and for each power of 10 you go up 10 decibels, so 60 decibels a million times, okay? Uh, let's move on to, uh, what's the next one? Sound intensity. Um, for sound intensity, um, well, that's basically the intensity level of sound. Sound, power of sound is kind of measured at the source of the sound. Intensity is how it impacts a space. So if you want a comparison, um, if you had a light bulb and it was in the center of a, <clears throat> of a room and the room, um, well, the intensity of the light in the room depends on different things. It depends on how strong the light bulb is. So the power of the light bulb, no matter what the room is like, no matter what the environment is like, the power is going to be the same. Say it's a 100 watt light bulb, okay? That never will change. But the intensity of the light can change based on the space because it depends on how far away the walls of the room are and it depends on how reflective. Like if you're in a medium sized room, like a living room, and there's white walls, the intensity of the light within the space at any point depends not only upon the light bulb which is a constant 100 watts, but it depends on the reflections. Same thing with sound. The intensity of sound depends on reflections, like reverberations and stuff like that. Okay, I won't get into any more about that because that's a little bit of a confusing one. Decibels SPL, sound pressure level. Okay, what's the referent amount for this one? It is... Uh, it's 20 micro pascals, which is equal to 0 0.02 UPA, I believe. Um, basically, sound pressure measures the pressure of the atmosphere on you. And this amount is a very, very small amount, and it is two ten billionths of an atmosphere. Okay, so atmospheres are measured in atmospheres. Um, if you're standing, if you're standing on the ground at sea uh, <coughs> sea level, um, base. This is an oversimplification, but basically that's one atmosphere. So two ten billionths of an atmosphere is a very small fraction of that. Uh, again, the reference amount always refers to 10 to the... Uh, well, it always, sorry, it always refers to zero decibels. Okay, I guess I kind of screwed that up earlier. Um, so zero decibels. Now, you would think that zero decibels means zero. There's nothing there. But there is something there. There's a small, small amount, your referent, uh, reference amount. And it's, it's a ratio, no matter what you do. So if you go 
from, well, for some of these things, it's hard to get to zero, okay? So for atmospheric pressure, let's assume that you can't quite get to zero. You can have smaller and smaller amounts. So is it possible in any of these systems to have a negative amount of decibels? Yes, absolutely. So if you started out and you were at two ten billionths of an atmosphere pressure, which is very faint, faint, faint pressure on your eardrum, what happens if you got one tenth, you, you moved into a position where you only had one tenth of that amount, so the amount, the small amount that was there has been reduced even further. Well, power of 10, you have to, if you're going up a power of 10, you add 10 decibels. If you're going down a power of 10, you subtract 10 decibels. So if we were at 0 0.2 10 billionths of an atmosphere, we'd be at negative 10 decibels. Okay, now this is kind of interesting because talking about the quietest, absolute quietest sound that can be heard. Um, the, the SIL level, I think the way it's set up is that zero decibels, kind of your base reference amount, is understood to be the very quietest sound that a human can theoretically hear. Now that's kind of hard to measure because, again, it's subjective. But this one is easy to figure out because it's based on something very numerical. Atmospheric pressure is is a is a known uh, a known quantity. Uh, I mean, it's dependent on on a lot of things. Now, I think SIL um, the way that's measured basically is that the the very lowest level zero decibels is assumed to be the absolute quietest sound that a person can hear. That's kind of subjective. It depends on the person, so that's not a, uh, that's not a number I like to work with. Something like this, SPLs, it's easy to understand exactly what it is, because when you're talking about a fixed number of atmospheres, we know how to define that scientifically. Okay, so because of this, it's easy to come up with some numbers, and apparently, under the SPL system, decibels SPL, the quietest noise that a human can hear is around negative 8 decibels. Okay, so that's kind of odd. I mean, obviously you'd think that they would set these systems up so the quietest thing would be zero. And, and I think that's how SIL is set up. But sound pressure, that's the way they made it. Negative eight decibels is uh, is a very quiet um, is a very quiet sound. Now, if you want a comparison of some other levels, this is the quietest thing. I don't know what it would be, just generic the quietest sound. If you go with a level that is eighteen decibels higher, so we're now into the pluses, plus ten decibels, SPL, something that's that loud, an example, is the hum of an incandescent light bulb. Okay, I bet you didn't know that incandescent light bulbs even hum. Fluorescent ones do, obviously, it's kind of easy to hear them sometimes, but even uh, your normal incandescents actually make a very quiet amount of noise. Now the problem is, the reason why most of you don't know that, is because when you're in a quiet room, usually the amount of background noise in the room is higher. It's 20 to 30 decibels SPL. So because of that, you know, when you're in a room where the background noise is 20 or 30 decibels, it's pretty understanding why you wouldn't be able to hear the light bulbs in the room. But they're actually emitting a sound as they, uh, when they're turned on. Okay, so what's the next one on the list? DBFS, I'll come back to that in a few minutes because that one is the most important one for us as audio producers. Uh, there's some other ones that deal with uh, power and, uh, and voltage, uh, electrical measurements. Uh, DBM, 
the M, small m, stands for miller, milliwatt, so 0 dBm equals 1 milliwatt. Uh, there's also a dBw, big W, where 0 decibels equals 1 watt. In terms of voltage, if you're measuring voltage in something, dB capital V is the voltage in volts. And there's another one, dBU, which is odd. It's also voltage, but instead of zero decibels being equal to one volt, uh, zero decibels in dBU is equal to 0 0.775 volts. And I'm not even going to try and explain that to you. Um, it's confusing, and it's not really relevant to our needs at this point in your audio careers. But we do need to figure out what this dBFS is, because that is a very important one. All right, so all the stuff that I've talked about so far has been quite important to the audio world. But this last topic that I'm going to cover is especially important for digital recording, okay? Save the best for last. So dBFS stands for decibels relative to full scale. Why is this important? Well, we have to come back to something that I didn't entirely cover earlier. <clears throat> I said earlier that 10 times the power is an increase of plus 10 decibels. What I didn't say was that 2 times the power equals an increase of 3 decibels. And that seems a little bit odd because you would think 10 for 10, why not 2, why wouldn't it be 2 decibel increase? Again, it comes back to this not being a linear correlation. It's an exponential, a logarithmic correlation. Okay? So just trust me on this, 2 times the power, 3 decibel increase. Well, there's a relationship between power and voltage where as power increases, voltage squared goes up. Um, so basically what this means, if you want to double the power in a voltage system, you're looking at a plus six decibel, twice as much, because powers of two add in a logarithmic system. Okay, so just trust the math on this. To double the power, you have to go plus six decibels voltage. Or to go one half the power, conversely, you go negative six decibels. Okay, so back to this, decibels relative to full scale. Something that we haven't really seen yet, I did allude to it a few minutes ago, and that's the fact that you can have negative decibel measurements. Now, if you think back to um, a DAW, an audio editor on a computer, uh, you've probably seen sound levels that start at zero and they go down. Okay, so negative 10, negative 20, negative 30, negative 40. And they probably go down to either a fixed number, like negative 96, or maybe negative 90. Or, in some pieces of software, they go negative infinity, which is interesting. Okay, this is because we are talking about digital measurements inside the DAW. Now, there is absolutely no correlation between analog measurements, sound volume, and digital measurements. Okay? Are the systems similar? Yes, very similar. But you can't just come up with some sort of equivalent formula. But it's the same sort of concept. Now, the only difference is, with most decibel systems, the ones we looked at before, um, you can have negative numbers, but in general, it's pretty rare to 
encounter negative amounts in the real world, usually you're starting a little bit, you're either starting at zero or a little bit above zero, and you're going up in volume as, as measurements get uh, larger. With digital, the other thing, the reverse applies. What happens with digital is you start at the top. So your reference, zero decibels, equals loudest possible volume. So how can you figure what, what the loudest possible volume is? You can always turn it up, right? Well, no, that's not the case. Because in the digital system, in your computer, there is really no such thing as volume, per se. Um, <clears throat> what happens? I mean, yes, your master level gets routed through your mix, through your speakers. So you kind of assume that, you know, you've got a volume that you're working with. But realistically, what happens is your computer outputs a signal and the volume is, not, is controlled not predominantly by the signal, the intent is for it to be controlled externally by the loudspeakers, or by your amplifier and your loudspeakers, okay? So they try to set it up so that when your computer is at its top value of zero decibels, then it's outputting your referent signal which is a very specific signal that your amplifier expects. And everything is relative to that referent amount, and it goes down. So when I talked about a few minutes ago how if you wanted to cut the voltage in half, you had to go negative 6, well, negative 6, negative 12, negative 18, and so on. Let's go down to negative 96, okay? Every time you go down 6 decibels, basically you're having the amount of signal, cutting the amount of signal in half. Again, talking about digital workspace here, okay? So, how does this relate to binary? You're probably thinking, why does binary come into this? Well, in our system, we're talking about 16-bit sample size. Okay, what's the biggest number that you can have in 16-bit binary? Well, it's 65535 in terms of base 10, but in binary, it's 16 ones. Okay, that is the largest possible number that can be represented in base 2 in a 16-bit word length. What happens if you have that number, let's say you're measuring a signal, and you add one to it. Well, if you add one to this, you overflow, okay? There's no more empty bits. There's no room for you to add one to this. So what happens? Well, <clears throat> perhaps the computer ignores the digit in front, and all of these ones become zero, because really, this number plus one in binary, if you had more bits to work with, would be one, zero, 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 zero. Zero, 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 zero. Okay? Maybe that's what happens. But, because it doesn't have that, it ignores it. And so your signal, instead of going just a tiny bit more, suddenly drops to zero. Okay? If you're playing with a volume which is very loud, quote-unquote loud, and all of a sudden you go up a little tiny bit and you go, go above the zero line, things go wrong. Maybe your computer thinks it's zero. Maybe it thinks it's a very low measurement. Maybe your computer just won't take it. 
maybe the computer stops it at this amount. Okay? Either way, this is what is called clipping, and it's digital clipping. Clipping in the analog world is very different. I'll get into that in a different video. Clipping in the digital world is very bad. As soon as you go a tiny, tiny fraction over this amount, clipping happens instantaneously. It's not something that gradually happens as you get louder and louder. Boom. Once you're over the line, it's like price is right. You know, the closest number without going over. So let's assume that you have a sound wave that's trying to go like this. Okay, if your zero level is at this, then what's happening? You can't have a number, a sample value, higher than this. Because remember, if this is your zero decibel line, then this zero means the highest possible number available. You can't have a higher number than the highest possible number. Computer doesn't like it. So, what happens to your real sample? Well, perhaps it goes like this. It goes up, and the computer just ignores any addition and stays at that level. And then it starts coming down. Well, actually, the same thing's happening on the bottom, so let's pretend that didn't happen. Okay, it keeps going up, but it hits the peak. It starts coming down, hits the peak. Okay, so what happens, this is one possibility. Your nice sine wave, sort of, if, if, your, if your sound wave, if your audio resembled a sine wave, all the tops get clipped off because it can't go above this number. And something with tops clipped off is going to sound a lot different than a sine wave. You're going to start sounding more like a square wave than a sine wave. And your audio is going to sound really weird, and that is one type of clipping. Or maybe, I'm not positive, but maybe you're in a situation where your audio editor tries to put that one out there, loses it, and then gives you a signal of zero. So as soon as you hit this point up there, it all of a sudden goes back to zero. And so your, your signal is more like going up, 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 and then psh, down to zero, and then down, 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 psh, up to zero. And you get a really weird... Actually, I should connect those. You get a really weird pattern that way, too. No matter what, you do not want to ever go above zero in a digital system. So, negative six. This amount is half as much as this amount. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of this? Well, it means zero, one, one, one. That's the binary representation of half of this number, essentially. Um, negative 12, you cut your power in half again. So what's your number then? 0, 0, 1, 1. I'm assuming you understand binary enough to know what I'm doing here. Okay, and it keeps going. 0, 0, 0, 1. Smaller and smaller signal levels. And when you get down to your lowest possible value, negative 96, or negative 90 in some systems, I think. That kind of confused me. Um, but you get to the lowest possible value, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, okay? And you can't get below that level. So basically what's happened here is we've just decided that in a 16-bit system with all these different signal possibilities because you start at the top you start at exactly zero and because every time you cut it in half you go down six decibels the lowest possible number is at negative 96 decibels in your system below that you hit what's called the noise floor Okay, you can't go below negative 96. Now, if you have a 96 decibel 
range. It's called a dynamic range. Okay, The dynamic range in a piece of music is the difference in decibels from the lowest signal to the loudest signal. So how do you get your lowest signal? That's a little bit tricky. That's when nothing is playing and you're measuring what's called the noise floor. I'll come back to the noise floor in a second. How do you get your highest signal? Well, that's when your music's the loudest. So the difference between your noise floor and your highest peak of the audio, that is your dynamic range. Now, if you've got, let's use this same chart again. Let's say that there's our 96 level, there's our zero level, okay? Let's say that for some reason, the background noise in your system, <clears throat> okay, well, let me explain the background noise for a second. There's two types of noise in a system. There's what's called instrumentation noise, and there's what's called physical noise. So, instrumentation noise is the noise of the system. And so that would be your negative 96. That's possibly your noise floor. Anything below that level won't be heard. It's like I talked about earlier. In a room that has some background noise, you can't hear the light bulb because it's such a faint noise. It's quieter than the background noise of the room. Well, same sort of thing here. If you're trying to record a signal that's quieter than the background noise of the room, you cannot hear it because it's too quiet. Okay, but there's also the possibility of physical background noise. So when you're recording in a studio, it may be that you can hear ductwork, you can hear taps running in the background, you can hear cars going by on a freeway outside the studio. And what if that noise, the physical noise, was faint, but it was four decibels higher than your noise floor. So you've got physical noise at negative 92. Okay, so that makes, assuming it's a constant amount of noise, that kind of gives you oh, a new noise floor because your actual effective noise floor is the higher of the two between the instrument, the background instrument noise and the physical noise. Okay, and then let's say your audio signal at some points here peaked at this negative six line. Okay, negative six. So your dynamic range of this piece is from negative six to negative 92, or in other words, you've got a dynamic range of 86 decibels. Now, is that good? 86 decibels? That's a huge dynamic range. I think that most commercial music nowadays, you're probably looking at a dynamic range of between 8 and 15 decibels. It's very squished. You know, during the quiet parts of the music, the audio signal's way up here. So the background noise floor never comes into play except between two songs. So if your dynamic range, if the quietest parts of your song are around negative 22, then your dynamic range is only 16, not 86. If you've got modern dance music, quite often they compress it beyond all rational thought, and they squish it to try and make it as loud as possible. Something interesting, Humans, almost almost every human, um, they generally, if they're given two different sound signals to listen to, they perceive the loudest one to be better quality audio. Our brain tricks us. And it's interesting because normally um, a sound difference of about one decibel is about the, um, the smallest possible difference between two sound levels that we can we can consciously tell is uh, is a difference in audio 
anything smaller than that, it kind of sounds like it's the same volume to us. However, scientists have done tests, and people with with good hearing that uh, like especially audio engineers. Um, if they are given two sounds that are only as small as 0.2 decibels apart, they may not sound any different, but to the people that are the subject of the experiment, they usually, um, you know, they'll be told, we're going to give you two different, uh, two different sounds of different audio qualities. Which one do you think is the better quality? They always are tricked. Their subconscious mind knows that one is a little tiny bit better, tiny bit louder, and they pick that one because they think it sounds better. Kind of weird. Anyway, because humans like louder music intuitively, people have taken advantage of this. Producers that are trying to get their music um, rated higher, what they'll do is they'll compress it to raise the overall average volume, so when it's played on the radio, Hopefully it's louder than the other songs around it, and people subconsciously think louder is better, and they like the song more. It's kind of a good experiment in psychology, but it works. And uh, and salesmen, audio salesmen, you know, you go to a to a store where the audio salesman is trying to sell you the more expensive stereo, and is being kind of uh, deceitful about it. Instead of telling you which of the two stereos has a better sound, what he'll do is he'll have the more expensive stereo turned up a little bit louder, and then you're standing there listening to the two, and you think, oh, that louder one sounds better. That's the one I want to buy. may not be any better, but whatever. So, dynamic range, we just covered. Noise floor, we just covered. When I talked about sampling earlier, I said that 16-bit is not necessarily as good as 24-bit. Well, how does a 24-bit signal work? This is so important. 24-bit signal works the same as a 16, but because you've got more bits, you can go down further. So instead of 0, negative 6, negative 12, blah blah, down to 96, You've got those extra eight powers, which means you can go down six decibels further eight times, which means you can go down to negative 144 instead of negative 96. So does that mean your signal is going to be any better quality? Well, what happens if all your audio that you're recording, what if none of it's down in this range down here? What if it's all in the range where it's floating around? What if it's all floating around in this range? Is the signal going to sound any different recorded 24-bit versus 16-bit when it's up in this range? I don't think so. It's exactly the same thing. So why do people say that 24-bit is better? Well, I'm going to save most of that for the next video, but I will say one thing. Because you have more room down below you, down towards the noise floor, you have an advantage. In the 16-bit system, you kind of want your audio to be recorded as loudly as possible. Because, say your average volume in 16-bit, I'll say blue is... 16 is blue. Okay, and let's say that your average volume is around negative 12 for the 16-bit system and your noise floor, let's say there's no system noise, there's no cars, you're in a really, really quiet studio somewhere, so the background noise actually happens to be the noise floor of 96. So background noise equals 96, then that means
<clears throat> your dynamic range goes from 96 to 12. Your signal to noise ratio, your signal's at 12, your background is at negative 96. That gives you um, a difference of 84, 84 decibels. Conversely, if we go with red as being the 24-bit system, and let's say that it's at the same level, basically, let's even say it's one lower. The difference between your signal at minus 13 and your noise floor, which is way down at 144, means your background noise is 144, negative, and that means your dynamic range is negative 144 to 13 is 131 decibels. So which is better? Higher number. <clears throat> what this means is the difference between the quietest and loudest parts of your music in a 16-bit system is only 84 decibels, which is still big. And in the 24-bit system is 131 decibels. Bigger signal-to-noise ratio, better in the 24-bit system. Now, does that make a big difference if you're actually sitting there listening, comparing the two? Well, no, it doesn't, I don't believe. So, technically, yes, this means that your 24-bit recording is slightly better quality in terms of the, uh, the noise floor and the signal-to-noise ratio. But, in terms of the actual sampling, there's not really a difference between 16 and 24-bit. However, like I say, there is another reason uh, that we'll look at in another video, which kind of explains why there is another advantage to 24-bit uh, session. And I'll give you a hint. It has to deal with your signal processing later, and it has to deal with the concept of dropping decimal points, or not dropping decimal points, or because you have to drop decimal points, uh, truncating information when you're doing signal processing. All right, that's my best attempt at trying to explain how the decibel uh, measurement systems work to you. I mean, it's, it's tough stuff. It's very difficult to learn this stuff. Uh, if you try to learn it out of a book, you're going to be looking at a university textbook with, uh, with pages and pages of formula and equations about logarithmic functions and all sorts of math and science terms. I mean, I got into a bit of math and science here, but that's, that's nothing compared to what you can learn relating to this, uh, to this sort of subject. Um, so what I've got is, I've got a blog post. If you look in the text description underneath the YouTube video here, I've got a link to the blog post, and I've tried to write some of this stuff out in, uh, in an organized and cohesive manner. So if you feel like skimming through that, hopefully that'll bring some additional uh, knowledge and understanding to what I've said here in the video. Do your best, do your best. And uh, if you don't fully understand this, don't panic. I mean, you can still progress in the, uh, in the uh, recording world without knowing all the stuff inside out. But the more you know, the more it helps, okay? So for the next video, I'm going to do one more theory video and I'll be getting into uh, the anti-aliasing and dithering. But uh, that's it for today. If you want to check out any of my other videos, check out djbolivia.ca slash videos. Thanks for watching.